Welcome everybody to the MGH Brain PBM Clinic. I'm Paolo Cassano. Today is March 17th, uh, 2023. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Stefano Pallanti, the director of the Institute of Neuroscience uh, in Florence, Italy, who is going to talk about uh, his experience with uh, ASD patients uh, with photobiomodulation. Um, thank you, Stefano, for being here, and please uh, take it away. It's a great page. Uh, thank you, Paolo. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, let me put my presentation on. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, this is the title. It's going to be a, quite a, a clinical uh, presentation, so we we have we are reporting not a regular trial but just our naturalistic uh, study on this uh, population okay see. okay this is my disclosure no much uh, we have also r21 grant to tms study and this is the outline of the presentation of today so just uh, a, a brief introduction about the concept of autism spectrum and its evolution uh, and a rationale for photobiomodulation. And we will present the case series that we recently published on children. <clears throat> and also we had a case report of a young adult, a uh, high functioning, uh, as we would say Asperger patient with a genetic uh, definition of, of autism. Uh, that has been uh, uh, treated with uh, photobiomodulation. Then, if we have time, we can uh, make a, a little run about uh, uh, the next uh, um, point of our project to uh, adopt uh, OEG signature for uh, to predict uh, the kind of treatment of, of, with photobiomodulation. So, everybody is familiar with uh, autism spectrum disorder, I guess, uh, is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders. Also recently, <clears throat> the field of autism has been reshaped because uh, we uh, <clears throat> has been considered not anymore a disorder itself. Uh, it might be a disorder, but uh, has been considered a neurotypology, neurodiversity, as well as ADHD. Uh, and it's, it comes to be a disorder only when it's related, uh, uh, associated to some uh, impairment, functional impairment, that's happened quite often, but it's not for every case. So, and the two uh, core dimension uh, as listed in the DSM-5, uh, impairment, social communication and repetitive behaviors. Uh, I want, uh, this is just one slide for historical slide to remember that uh, I, the concept of autism uh, start, uh, the name was coined more than a century ago, and was it, the first time was adopted by Holger Bloiler, a Swiss psychiatrist, uh, but it was the same that uh, um, um, gave the name of schizophrenia, no? changing from dementia to schizophrenia. And according to his observation, uh, uh, the, the term autism was uh, adopted to describe a, a loss of awareness of external events and preoccupation with self of one old thought, and was considered one of the four fundamental uh, symptomatology of schizophrenia. So in this, it's interesting to remember that it was considered as part of a uh, fundamental part of schizophrenia, so a, a psychopathological experience, and also related to a form of retirement from external events. So uh, in two, uh, coupling the two meaning of psychopathological experience and his relationship to autoritism or autosexuality, because the, the term autism is a, is a collapse of his two words. And uh, this is just to remind that probably is a word that we should uh, renew, because I don't think that it makes any sense today to, to use a name that was coined to describe a form of self erotism in, in schizophrenia, but still is still uh, largely used and is getting more popularity recently. But now we have a completely different uh, uh, concept of uh, autism, and we talk about autism spectrum because we know that there is not a, a homogeneous condition, but there is a lot of genetic uh, source and probably 
as a, a, a list century of uh, of different uh, of different uh, uh, neurofunctional mechanisms that involve a genetic mechanism, Im immune disease regulation, and uh, neurofunctional alteration. The general concept is that there is a genetic predisposition, and some, in some form, it, a, a epigenetic predisposition that uh, is a, a cause of an imbalance between plasticity and uh, the immune regulation of, uh, of the plasticity. And uh, now there is also a search for the different uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, underpinning uh, the DSM, the DSM-5 description of uh, autism spectrum disorders. Uh, here I show you the, the agenda that was published uh, all, all now 20 years ago, uh, the research agenda for DSM-5, it was supposed to, to create a, a, a marker for clinical condition. And the most con convincing marker should be the genetic one. Uh, in the field of autism, uh, several diff, uh, sub, sub Phenotype has been related to specific genetic uh, uh, um, genetic uh, um, form, and uh, every time that uh, the, genet the genetist uh, describes one of these form, this form is moved from the mental condition to neurological condition. This is a kind of weird, but it's what is happening all the time. So. Uh, since uh, that autism is a condition that is related to inflammation and imbalance between immune and, um, uh, activity and plasticity, several uh, evidence uh, are consistent and, uh, so, um, and show several association uh, with uh, uh, inflammatory cytokine and uh, um, expression, clinical expression of, of autism. Uh, we've increased level of most of the inflammatory cytokine in the, either in the plasma or in, in the brain. And this uh, uh, immune alteration is also related to a uh, functional al al alteration. Most of the time, most uh, of this is related to the four mode network uh, that is uh, from the most prominent uh, neurobiological and consistent features of AC, uh, 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 autism spectrum. That, uh, uh, involve also a, an imbalance with the attentional network. Uh, so if we consider uh, the, um, this uh, evidence about the uh, importance of inflammation and impairment of plasticity in the uh, other um, condition uh, that uh, are related to autism, uh, uh, PBM uh, is presenting as a, a strong candidate for the treatment of this large population, especially if you consider that there are no any established pharmacological treatment for the core future of, of any autism spectrum disorder condition. So uh, it's important to open to new uh, opportunity. Uh, to, uh, before we come to the clinical setting, uh, is, is in, important to consider what has been shown in, in a preclinical study, uh, where um, quite recently, you see 2022, uh, a model of autism that has been produced in, in mouse with uh, injection of a valproate uh, uh, that is a considered a good uh, inducer of uh, autism behavior in, in mouse. Uh, enhancing the inflammation uh, through an activation of macroglia and uh, reactive activation of society uh, with the expression of this uh, um, behavioral abnormality uh, in social behavior and repetitive behavior. And uh, in this model of valproate induced uh, uh, autism, photobiomodulation has increased at the level of behavior uh, spontaneous alternation and reduce the uh, impairment related to repetitive behavior. Meanwhile, uh, the same, the photobiomodulation has been able to reduce uh, the activation uh, of the macroglia, especially in the region of the hippocampus, uh, but not in the prefrontal cortex uh, at, uh, at the way line length of 830. Uh, so it's interesting because this is an animal model that show 
uh, efficacy on reduction, not, not, not only the behavior, but uh, even to correct the activation of the microglia. <laughs> the first study with light uh, that is not uh, is a different form of light, not photovermodulation, but a pulse laser of a uh, uh, wavelength of uh, 635 uh, and uh, has been done in a, in a quite a large population of uh, children with autism uh, in range uh, 5 to 16 years of age. And uh, uh, you see this a description of the population. Uh, it's important because this is a clinical study and show that uh, uh, this exposition to with laser light uh, 6300 uh, of we learned, uh, uh, induce a significant reduction of aberrant behavior check uh, um, in, in this population, and also uh, a, correlated with an improvement in clinical global impression. So that this subject, little kids uh, between six and, and 15, have a reduction of aberrant behavior and improving their social uh, skill uh, with a clinical improvement. Uh, before we, um, we have done this uh, study uh, uh, that is, uh, is well, it was done to, uh, in Florence with collaboration of our other center. You see uh, the uh, Fatto Bene Fratelli Sacco Milan uh, uh, Hospital Buzzi uh, of children and, and uh, other, um, and with the department of, of Albert Einstein College in New York. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this is the first study uh, using a, a lead photobiomodulation in children. Uh, why uh, Desmond uh, used a laser light? Laser, I'm not to, to tell you in detail, but laser is a, a amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, um, and it is it, 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 monochromatic and has a deeper uh, penetration. In the, in the lead we use is that. Uh, have a large area of tissue uh, and particularly suitable for frontal region stimulation. So we, we thought that is probably uh, be a better uh, device for treatment of this population. We enroll uh, 21 uh, patients, little patient. The range of age was uh, almost the same of the previous one. You see range from five and 15 years of age. Um, uh, none of them was under psychopharmacological treatment. You see, most of them were receiving uh, like prebiotic or probiotic, uh, and uh, they have uh, quite the uh, normal comorbidity for ADHD and uh, or other form of, uh, of positive behavior. And uh, uh, the alpha simulator device deliver. 810 near uh, infrared light pulsing at, at 10 hertz, and uh, we use an helmet uh, of a V light, and uh, they receive uh, treatment at home for five days a week for six months. So it was a long study, but it was uh, feasible because uh, it's easy to treat uh, this young patient when you can give them the helmet and they can use it at their home. Uh, each session, uh, the duration of each session was 20 minutes. Uh, during that, uh, the young patients were involved in some um, interesting for them activity. And uh, you see some of the data about uh, the uh, posterior anterior transcranial lead. And we use uh, for the assessment the uh, child autism rating scales, uh, that is a scale that uh, consists in 14. Uh, 24 items uh, uh, parent rated. Uh, sometimes we use also blind rated, just not to to be too much bias from the uh, to be a knowledge of a treatment in course. And then uh, the other instruments that is uh, the autism parenting stress index uh, that is a 15 item parent rated, which assessed uh, as well uh, the level of distress uh, that uh, the uh, guardian of the parents have to deal uh, uh, in order to 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 um, uh, to spend their time with those little uh, children and assess specifically uh, social disability uh, physical issue and other social uh, dysfunctional behavior uh, also 
we uh, try to get a measure. Uh, you see all these are uh, measure rated from uh, external uh, assess because you know uh, that is difficult to get uh, uh, personal individual assessment for each of these subject of attention of other dimensions. So we, we decide to use uh, is uh, uh, probably less uh, uh, sensitive, but uh, 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 more friendly use of assessment. And so the, the attention deficit scale of, uh, for parents uh, that consists in, in two sub subscales uh, that uh, uh, involve the assessment of either attentional span and impulsivity. And also we, we study the peaceful sleep quality index as other uh, dimension of, of, a, of a clinical assessment. So it's interesting because after uh, the six months, uh, the, uh, you see that we have a nice reduction of the cuts after the interview, a quite significant uh, reduction of it. And also we have, uh, we use the Montefiore Einstein rigidity scale and so we have a reduction of the most problematic uh, features uh, in autistic children that is, uh, you know, they are binding to, to routine that uh, make very difficult uh, the life in, in family and, uh, and the social involvement. Also, we report an, an improvement in, in sleep uh, quality that you see interesting that we have, uh, uh, after three months, we already have uh, uh, a good improvement that uh, uh, that uh, is uh, consistent after six months, but most of the change happened in the very first three months of the treatment. So probably the length was uh, even too, too long to, to uh, probably a shorter trial would be probably already enough. Also, we have uh, an improving attention according to the uh, assessment. In this case, uh, we have a further improve after three months and six months, we, uh, apparently attention was better than just after three months. So, so that is uh, interesting because we, we now we plan to, to treat uh, uh, children with just ADHD to see if there is uh, any uh, good improvement in this dimension. Uh, that is another condition where we consider as a, a autism immune behavioral condition, so something related to inflammation and uh, disorder in executive function. So uh, also uh, the, what is interesting that uh, uh, parenting stress was reduced uh, either social but also in home situation that uh, the, was uh, quite uh, uh, appreciated by the family itself. So uh, about children, uh, we uh, we found that uh, they, our observation uh, were quite encouraging. And but as we told you, we use uh, off-label uh, uh, photobiomodulation for several conditions to to our institute here in Florence for TBI uh, or a concussion. We have used for my cognitive impairment uh, uh, according to the preference uh, and. And we were informing concept of the patient, but uh, most of the uh, of most of the condition has not really any any good uh, approved uh, treatment. So most of the population we treat are also already resistant to uh, to the um, uh, usual treatment. And uh, so we consider uh, uh, also the, um, to use it in, in a harder population. This is a study that has been run. Uh, uh, with a, a group uh, that is related to Paolo Cassano, with adults without functioning uh, spectrum disordered uh, behavior, uh, age between 18 and 59. Of course, uh, this, uh, what is interesting in this population that uh, we, we consider adult uh, probably uh, less uh, uh, active in terms of plasticity compared to children. So is it, it's important to see if the same treatment can be effective also in adult population. And uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, the measure here, uh, either clinic, clinical um, or self or informal rated measure, and after only three weeks of photobiomodulation, uh, that with a, 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 a 830 uh, uh, wavelength, uh, 
report a significant improvement in uh, most of the dimension uh, residuity and um, disturbance behavior and social communication, social motivation, uh, social cognition. So really the core dimension of, of, a, uh, of the autism, not just uh, you know, the reduction of irritability or pulsivity, you know, uh, usually the target of pharmacological treatment, but really an improvement uh, in the social cognition that is really uh, very interesting data according to my experience. So uh, our, uh, at this point, uh, we, we might consider uh, PVM as uh, um, probably one of, the, of the, a few or, uh, treatment that uh, have some positive effect on the uh, score features of an autistic uh, patient, adult and uh, children. And the issue is that uh, we don't really know what could be really the best uh, if uh, the alpha protocol that uh, uh, could be probably more suitable for the reduction of the rigidity and sleep improvement. And, and on, of course, uh, consequently improvement in some of the executive function or the improvement in attentional function could lead uh, to a, a reduction of stress and before a uh, reduction of rigidity uh, or maybe a combination of the two. Of course, uh, we don't have number of experience uh, large enough uh, to make uh, really a preference of the two uh, treatment. Um, and then we, we, uh, we, we try the same uh, PBM uh, treatment on a, a case of, of uh, genetically characterized autism in a young adult. Uh, we have a patient, a high functioning patient with a SCN to a mutant uh, genetic that has been studied in, uh, in mouse, but also in, uh, in human. We know uh, this is a short description of, of, of this patient, noise or seizure, uh, that is important because uh, uh, the same genetic uh, mutation, SCN2A, has been related to a form of uh, most of the cases of seizure. It's probably a bridge uh, between seizure and autism. You know that 50%, almost 50% autistic subjects also have seizure or history of seizure. And it's related uh, to uh, uh, the codify, SCN codify a protein that uh, uh, in the brain that is called uh, sodium channel, and uh, uh, due to this uh, um, specific uh, um, genetic uh, modification of the sodium channel, uh, this subject unusually have neurodevelopmental disorder, seizure, but also uh, is in interesting because uh, some of them uh, has been uh, responsive to implantable device such, such as vagus nervous uh, uh, stimulation and uh, before is a form that has been already involved in uh, treatment with some form of neuromodulation. So uh, this is a, a, um, our, our respondent uh, was different from normal. You see the blue line compared to the green one that is a normal one. Uh, so we, we, this subject, we assessed a, a, an attentional dysfunction as well as a, a repetitive behavior and rigidity. Uh, this was a subject that has been treated with several pharmacological treatment and, and uh, psychological treatment without any success. And uh, this uh, MRI of this subject has shown uh, not only a hypofrontality, but the lack of a parasingular sulcus. And although we have this, uh, uh, this kind of a modification of the brain uh, uh, and the go to a 40 minutes gamma protocol, with intranasal simulator for five days a week for six weeks uh, with eight, uh, uh, 10, uh, 810 um, near infrared light pulsing. And uh, you see that uh, we have an improvement, significant improvement in battery deficit in the executive functioning scale. Also, an improvement in the stop signal task with a reduction that is usually related to a reduction also in impulsive behavior. And so an improvement in time management, problem solving, self-regulation, and attenuation of impulsive behavior. But also, uh, I mean, um, 
he assessed also in a social life of his subject that is uh, as uh, uh, most of the autistic uh, people socially isolated but is is a student uh, it was and it was difficult for him to to pursue his career and instead after the treatment he have uh, such a good improvement that is now uh, running to to get uh, a um a college degree and uh, so the improvement was really significant he's still doing this treatment after months and he's still probably keep him improving uh, in in uh, executive functioning and in, in, in uh, student activity so uh, pvm is a candidate treatment for coefficient in a, a autism spectrum we have animal model we have some uh, preliminary data and children of groups of course, uh, we are looking for predictors, uh, uh, clinical predictors like EEG or, uh, to a specific protocol because we, we don't have, uh, we adopt uh, the standard protocol for this population, but might be different. Also, we don't know what we, if you have to make, to couple with specific uh, activation or exposition during the treatment. We, we don't really know what would be uh, better to improve uh, the, um, at the results of this, uh, um, of course, we can make some hypothesis about why this uh, photobiomodulation uh, can improve uh, the function of executive function. Uh, with a recent uh, paper about uh, uh, transcribed photobiomodulation associated with uh, uh, improvement in cerebral vascular oxygenation in the frontal cortex, so it might be a mechanism in this population. And, uh, uh, also, uh, we are now collecting EEG uh, signature of autism in order to find if there is any correlation between the response and the frequency of the photo photobiomodulation. And if, if uh, you know, if there is a population that uh, could be preferably treated treat with a high, uh, low frequency or high frequency, that is still an open issue. And uh, uh, we talk about EG because it's the most easy to get, uh, uh, um, I mean, assessment, neurofunction assessment with population. Uh, even EG is not, is not so easy because uh, uh, not all of them like to, to be uh, record uh, with EG, but uh, anyhow, it's much uh, easier than any other form of neuro, neurofunction assessment, like MRI or something like that. So, and also it's very uh, time, um, Time consider the time frame, you know, we, we got uh, good information as well with EG. So just to uh, to come to a conclusion, we are exploring the possibility to adopt specific protocol uh, and intensity on this population, but uh, we are confident that after that, the, the study that we ran and all the other information we collect from the uh, from the uh, mouse uh, modeling and then from uh, other population that uh, is, uh, is, a, is a, a new open street for uh, maybe an avenue, not only street, for, for uh, the treatment of this uh, uh, so difficult uh, to treat condition, uh, even when uh, uh, it's characterized genetically, you know, because we, uh, there is this bias, but you have, when you have the genetic, uh, it becomes neurological disorders. And so it changes uh, category and is not uh, uh, anymore a condition treated by uh, psychiatrists or psychology. But in this, in this case, we show that uh, even when you have uh, uh, such uh, uh, a definition, you, you might be um, a candidate for photobiomodulation as well. So I, I end my presentation. I'm open to. Uh, question or comments and once thank again you. thank you for, for listening to me <laughs> thank you so much stefano um and um, um apologies so i'm actually on my cell phone and uh, i had some uh, connectivity issues so i might have missed something um i cannot quite see the entire audience so um people can uh, probably will have to raise their hand and and jump in and and maybe david can help us as well uh, i have one question to start uh, um which mm. is uh, i was curious about your cohort it's quite impressive that you followed them for 
for six months, right? And uh, yeah. you have been treating them for that long. So uh, did I understand right that they had their device at home? Is that what it was? Yes, uh, this is why it was easy to treat them, you know, because we, we are used to make uh, like uh, uh, first uh, a few days uh, here in the Institute and when we are open to make tutorial during uh, by telepsychiatry during the treatment, uh, even to collect the data during the, uh, that span of time. And that is the only way we have to treat uh, this population because you cannot uh, ask to them to come to visit your office, uh, you know, five days a week for, or even three, three days a week for uh, such a long time, so. Of course, of course. And so that was my second question. So was the treatment uh, daily or nearly so? Was it five days a week or? Yeah, it was, it was supposed to be five days a week. Uh, Sometimes we miss uh, some, a few, like four to, uh, instead of five weeks, but no, no less than four weeks, uh, so for six months. And what was the acceptability? How, how did it go? And uh, also I was wondering, the, the uh, neuro, uh, be like neuro, uh, I think it was designed for, for adults. Uh, so I wondered how, what adjustment you had to make, if any, um, for children. Uh, I, I see we don't have really much problem adjusting for children with uh, uh, devices. So it was uh, quite easy to, to adjust for them. Not, not, not really big, uh, big deal, no. Okay, great. These were my questions. So if anyone else has questions, please go ahead and David, please help them if any. Dr. Attila. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear. Well, thank you very oh. much, Ayanti, for uh, this uh, presentation. Um, and it, 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 one question I had was is the, um, the, when, you know, looking at the scales, sometimes so some of the scales do cluster the RRBs and the sensory integration problems uh, together and it's uh, but um unfortunately though the uh, the sensory integration problem the mechanism of it may not always real you know um uh, rest in the brain in the brain tissue and that uh, there's some uh, there's some evidence that um the peripheral nervous system um uh, the buildup or the, the composition of it is the variance in uh, change, uh, different responses to uh, affective touch or caress or uh, pain uh, conduction is um, uh, skewed in, in, in kids with ASD. So we may not be able to detect um, a change perhaps in the RRBs uh, or repeat the repetitive behaviors because scales uh, kind of cluster these. Um, did you uh, see any move? Yeah, I saw uh, the findings regarding uh, the social salience. Did you see, uh, be, uh, were you able to take a look at um, um, sort of uh, specific item distribution of the RRBs and separate out the sensory integration and see if there's any improvement in the RRBs that way? Mm. Oh, thank you so much. And I mean, it's a very acute and precise uh, uh, and a grounded uh, comment to what we report. Unfortunately, the number is, uh, is not uh, large enough uh, to, to get some really uh, signal above it. But I think that uh, we have to consider, uh, you, you are touching really a very, very good point for uh, next uh, uh, um, study. But do you think that we need a, a different instrument? Do you recommend any other instrument for distinguishers, different dimension? Do you have anything in mind? Well, I, 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 I we, do, we do use uh, the SRS, which does have the RRB, but mm -hmm. it, it too combines it. Um, but uh, we, yeah, we identify those uh, items and can look at those. We, uh, so uh, I think when in the but in the classical scoring or in a traditional scoring of these scales, it's the the RRB and the social the four domains of the social interaction, the you know, cognitive, mm -hmm. motor, awareness, and uh, communication. 
but so the RRB, we will need to uh, manually uh, separate out uh, those ah. items. Okay. Thank you. Good suggestion. Yeah, I, I, um, I just want to comment on this work. Actually, I'd like to comment Dr. Palanti. I think he did this under quite challenging circumstances, getting getting the studies of the ground in Italy. I learned this in a conversation with him. So yeah. um, uh, there was uh, questions about alpha and gamma. Mm. And uh, actually, I just saw this morning, there was a publication yeah. that came out of you know, Fudan University in China, uh, talking about pulsing, you know, and uh, different power density and so on. It, uh, it seems like pulsing matters. And they identified uh, 40 hertz as probably getting the most out of uh, out of the uh, response from the cells. They did actually an in vitro study on new neuroblastoma. But that's an aside. Uh, we uh, so I led you a little bit on on some of the um, maybe a bit of secret and some of the pre preliminary data out of a lot of work we're doing actually. We uh, in collaboration with a number of uh, you know universities um, and our team, we are we are doing EEG uh, observations. We are doing living cells of observations. We publish one. We uh, we are continuing the study uh, mainly on the effect of pulsing. Um, we have an ongoing fMRI, a very super interesting study that I kind of briefly shared with Luis when we were at, um, at a conference recently. And this is what I see, you know, I'm observing that, so I might be wrong when we've, we're done with all these different studies, but what I'm observing is um, that al alpha is stimulatory and gamma at 40 hertz seems to be a switch going over to inhibitory. So we published a paper in 2017 looking at what the effect of gamma. Actually, uh, we didn't have enough word space to go talk a bit more about the inhibitory side of it. We saw global inhibition at, at gamma at 40 hertz. Now on the, um, so what we observe in the living cell study is, um, so we saw, of, you know, the um, response in terms of cells resilience to, external damaging factors like you induce like, you know, a standard procedure, 50 kilohertz, 100, kilo, 100 kilohertz into the cell, you expect the cells to see what happens to the cells. They were resilient at 50, uh, at 50, at 50 kilohertz. Um, and they were showing resilience uh, that were measurable in terms of resistance. So you measure in terms of resistance and how the electrical, electrical currents are flowing through. Okay, we have that. Uh, we continue to do, it's not published yet, um, bring up to a, a hundred, a hundred and then to a thousand Hertz and found that we don't have the same thing. It seems to be, have the opposite effect. And this is very similar also to uh, when we had it continuous. So something is there that is yet to be fine-tuned and discovered further. And there was also a published study, actually I'm not sure it's published, but quite high level physicists uh, at University of Alberta, I think um, the Princeton people and, and um, notable physicists were involved. They actually saw uh, a spike in electrical flow at 39 Hertz to be exact, you know. So that is, uh, so we are discovering something new here. Now, what, why are we seeing a difference um, in say Dr. Palanti's work? Now we, so those modules are positioned on the, mode, the, no, the, the nodes of the default mode network. And here again, I'm drawing inferences from our ongoing study on meditation too, how people are getting into this, um, a bliss state at a certain frequency. But I had a challenge at the time. I say, okay, we're putting on a default mode network is related to meditation. Uh, but, uh, but in meditation, you get into a higher state when 
you shut off the default mode network. So does it mean that we are actually shutting off the default mode network at a certain frequency that allows meditators to go into a higher state? And uh, we experimented because we positioned these nodes into other non-default mode network position. The results are, are different. So, so that means what it is inferring is at a higher frequency, which is much higher, much higher than 10 for some meditators, like 400 hertz, you know. Um, and uh, what happens, is I think at that point, for them, for many of us, it's 40 hertz. For these people, it is at a much higher frequency. It shuts down the default mode network and it activates, according to the literature, uh, you get into a higher meditative state or higher state of consciousness or whatever. When you shut down the default mode network, and activate the salience network. And in meditation, the insula, the lateral insula, and um, the anterior cingulate cortex are relevant. So you shut it down, you activate these other ones, you get to a high state. So now I'm drawing this together. So I, it's kind of like, kind of like uh, drawing a lot of things together. Uh, I'm not sure if you're paying attention to everything I'm saying, but drawing this together, I'm saying, that there is a difference between 10, between different pulse frequency, we have to explore that. Um, so when we are drawing a higher attention level with 40 Hertz, I think, you know, when you want attention, be aware of stuff, you want to shut down the default mode. So at 40 Hertz, you're starting to switch over and shutting down the default mode. Okay, and then you allow, you know, uh, it, your brain to go into salience and go into higher awareness and, and stuff like that. So the, yeah, we have a lot of work to, uh, going on. There is one day I will, you know, share with you the data we have. The power density matters a lot. I was shocked actually at how relevant power density is um, between, you know, uh, 50 megawatts, I'm uh, oh, sorry, milliwatts, 100 milliwatts, above that, it, it, it all matters and it's quite precise. So we are still doing experiment and I hope that we, in time, we will get more precision in the way we do for the bion modulation. Uh, it is super interesting. So I just want to briefly share uh, the relevance of pulsing different frequencies here. Thank you, Lou. I was curious if, um, um, besides power density, if uh, total total power or total energy delivered uh, mattered as well. And of course, you mentioned both the in vitro studies, and I'm not sure if some of the studies you were mentioning were were in humans. Uh, um, so I don't know what, what your thoughts are there. Okay. Um... So there are two aspects of the one is we, you know, we have an ongoing investigation using fMRI at different pulse frequencies and also at different power densities as well. Um, so they, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but they do matter. Uh, I'll take, for example, when we pulse at 40 Hertz transcranial, um, actually, we use laser because the only way you can see real time changes in a MRI scanner is not to have metal. So we're not able to use LED. We use um, our lasers and we you know played around with the parameters and so on, and we did the measurements. Now what we saw is at uh, 40 Hertz, the peak actually, based on pre preliminary data, you know we still need to maybe clean up some stuff, is a hundred. Uh, milliwatts, and we measure a beam, beam spot size of one square centimeter. And it actually gone went negative when we increase the power to 250 milliwatts. So there is, it matters. And some other um, power density don't seem to show anything. So, uh, so we are doing all this work and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to nail down what the power densities are. Now, bear in mind, we were using lasers. This is 808 
um, we were playing around with 808 and 64 nanometers and see which is you know showing the differences. Uh, but um, you know this this is uh, this is what I want to share. In principle, I would say for precision, um, pulsing matters, power density matters, and when you talk about total uh, dose, yeah, we we also have those. Uh, as you accumulate the dose, as you probably know from the bi-based bi-phasic response um, theory, uh, the, actually too much dose, you do see a negative as well. So some of the questions are, should we do more power and make it shorter or less power and do it longer? In fact, the paper I saw today actually answered the question they said. Um, they feel that actually um, higher power, the right kind of power, at a, for a shorter period seems to give better results. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, stay tuned. This is very interesting. So um, I apologize, I don't see everybody. So um, I, I want to let other people also comment or, or, or Stefan or answer. I had a quick question for you, however, before I switch. Uh, I was the, um, the biomarker that was going up or down? Uh, were you looking at ball signal or, or, or something else? So connectivity on, uh, on the MR? Okay, I'm not sure if people are hearing me. Um, yes, we can hear you, Paul. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I don't know if uh, um, uh, well, but it, it's we can go ahead. I mean, uh, and uh, if anyone else has any comments or or thoughts, um... I I think Marnie found the uh, biomarkers uh, NAA uh, changes in the MRS for um, her study on TBI. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, we did, and it was in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is pretty interesting, also. So, um, and in terms of functional connectivity, we found it after um, treating all over the head or with the V-light neurogamma in our first case who had to treat at home after he could no longer, he wasn't even around to treat at the hospital anymore with the whole head. Um, yeah, it was uh, a, a change, an increase in the functional connectivity, very strong in the salience network. And we never did find anything for the default mode network, but that was the network we were treating. And uh, Linda Chow out in San Francisco found the same thing in her TBI case. She has a hockey player with uh, I don't know, six concussions in five and a half years, 23 years old. And she treated the default mode network and the change was in the um, salience network. So. Yeah, you can mark that. This NAA is incredibly sensitive. And NAA is uh, correlated with oxygenation in the mitochondria, uh, wherever you want to study it. And you can study it with MR spectroscopy. I did have one question um, uh, for our speaker. And I wanted to know if he had any outliers uh, in his 21 cases who did exceptionally well or did exceptionally poorly? Um, and I know you had many variables you were studying, but I was interested in the outliers. And I wanted to know if um, how you were able to get, if you know if the children or parents were um, able to part the hair or be sure they had hair, good hair, con good contact with scalp. I think contact with scalp is very important. And I just wondered if you had special instructions for them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we, I, about the outlier, uh, we might have. I, I never, you know, we might have uh, it come to my mind uh, uh, at least one uh, that did extremely well. This is why it was easy then to enroll other subjects because when you have one uh, doing really good, they uh, speed around the, uh, the information and, and it's, a, it's the best uh, publicity you can make for this treatment. And, me, and we are still following up. I mean, because in oh. some cases we have improvement also in in uh, in uh, language communication with children. Also, <laughs> it was not really the target, but uh, it was extremely interesting. And about so maybe we. Should... 
we should uh, uh, follow up better this subject to, to see uh, if, a, if this improvement uh, uh, really uh, was consistent and uh, or not. But uh, uh, yeah, right. I mean, if it's little sample, you should consider outlier as a Robin described it also in the paper, not just a specific function. Mm -hmm. I, I especially because it's a genetically uh, a kind of a blending, not genetic. So we should have a, a different approach. And about the uh, uh, use of a device, uh, we uh, the parents were trained uh, for a few days. Uh, so it was uh, something that uh, involved not just one session, because usually the patients stay like three, four, five days. Uh, in the institute for uh, all the day. And then, uh, so when they become really expert, uh, we are available for tutorial online, but they, they really, you know, after a few days, uh, they start to be kind of expert in how to apply the device. So now oh, we okay. care about that. Even we are, we are doing TMS also in this institute. And I used to have one, at least one clinical psychology stay on the coil of the patient because I know how it's important to, to keep, you know, the. Uh, the, the target and uh, the content. No, no, it's a very good uh, recommendation as well, yeah. Thank you, and your talk was wonderful in your papers too, so thank you for that. Thank you, thank you so much, thanks. I also had a follow-up question on that. I wonder if any of your patients um, seem to be overdosed. Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, uh, nearly daily treatments are for, for everyone and uh, especially children, uh, they will have a greater um, penetration of light. So I don't know if you had that experience with any of your participants. Uh, no, not in this group, I have to be sincere, not in this group, but sometimes we have some of these experience and, and uh, they, uh, they really have uh, some other, not in, in the sample we published, but uh, in other children with a neurodevelopmental disorder, and uh, we have uh, uh, we experience difficulty in following up uh, treatment because of uh, those we have to to uh, to uh, prolong the length of time between one treatment and the others. So is also we should probably uh, report also this uh, case series even if uh, they are not really. I mean the finding is not. Uh, probably scientifically so relevant, but it's important for the clinician to, to know that this uh, can happen and how to deal with that. And how, uh, because we, we are doing it based on our clinical judgment, we don't have really guideline not how to, to reduce uh, or to enlarge in order to get the better response. Yeah. We, um, we haven't had any problems with the daily treatments either so far, Paolo, with kids. We're running a protocol. We're doing a protocol, having a protocol with autistic traits in ADHD and um, and our uh, double-blind adults. And so far, we don't have any. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, these are daily treatments up to 40, 50 minutes with yeah. eight, uh, autistic, you know. So, Attila, so you're saying that uh, daily treatments seem to be well-tolerated and there's no adverse um, effect or, or decrease of effect. Okay. No adverse effect. I don't know about the decreased effect, but mm -hmm. we will see. We'll see. All right. Uh, so I think we're just about the time. Um, thank you, Stefano. I mean, a very, very thought provoking. Uh, I thank you all for this interesting discussion. And I guess to be continued that the next time. <laughs> Thank you. Take Thank care. You all. Have a good weekend.